Hello, Joseph Babaifa family. Once again, Joseph Babaifa here. And the day has finally come, the moment we've all been waiting for, the video of Eshu versus Elegua. Who are these gentlemen? What do they represent? And what is the difference, right? Before we get into this video, if this is your first time visiting the channel, welcome. Please be sure to subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can get wonderful videos like this and more on Joseph Babaifa YouTube channel, right? So guys, we're gonna delve right into it. So before we get into, you know, their relationship and where they differ and where they coincide, we're gonna get into each of them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, right? So the first guy we're gonna begin with is the root of this whole situation, which is Eshu, which is the guy on my shirt, right? Eshu, so we're gonna go ahead and talk about the birth of Eshu, because ironically, Eshu was never really born. He kind of always was. And when we get into this, we have to delve directly into the Odu of Oyekumeji, where the energy or essence of Eshu first manifested. And the reason this is so coincidental or so divine is because Oyekumeji is seen as within the corpus of Ifa as the Odu of the darkness, right? Or the absence of light. Ironically, this is where Eshu resides. So what happened was, is in the beginning, there were a couple different entities. The, the first one, or not necessarily saying in chronological order, but one of the ones that was there was uh, Olodumari, right? The essence of the light, the essence from which life was prophesied to come from. Another entity that's believed to have been there was Iamio Shoronga, right? The elders of the night who have the job of installing the misfortune that we as human beings garner through our lack of Iwapele or good conduct. And we also had Eshu, right? Who is the absence of light or the expanse of the cosmos in that aspect, whether it be our shadow, the dark part of our mind that we can't see see behind our eyes or the nape of our necks or the other half of ourselves, right? That which is prehistoric. And another thing that was actually there, which, you know, most scripture of Ifa that I've read has been able to identify um, as not being created either was the concept of time. All of these things always were necessarily. Nothing was or none of these things was actually created um, through the theology of Ifa as the way it's viewed, right? So what ended up happening was, is Olodumare, at this point, was one speck of light, or one atom of light, or a photon, as we could say. And he wanted to expand. He wanted to grow. He realized how lonely it was in the expanse of the cosmos. And he said, you know, it's time for me to expand and have children and uh, create a, uh, a universe and create life, right? Because, you know, uh, eons and eons of uh, this situation can make anybody a little bit depressed. So what ended up happening was, is he had a conversation and who he had a conversation with was Mr. Eshu himself, right? So they had this epic dialogue in history where they started talking and Olodumare looked at Eshu and said, hey, you know what needs to happen? And Eshu said, yep, I know the prophecy and I know that which uh, needs to occur. You need to expand and life needs to happen and human beings and Ifa and all of these different things. And, and that's perfectly fine. But I have some conditions before you expand, right? And Olodumare said, state your terms. He said, you know, I want to be present. I want to make sure that I'm not completely eliminated. I still want my domain to be larger than that which your children in, uh, inhabit. And I want to be the one that tests them to make sure whether they're worthy of receiving your blessings or not. Because you're coming providing a lot and I want to make sure you're not taken advantage of either. So me and you can always be in harmony, harmony and perfect balance. So... Before you give them ashe or blessings, I want to be the one who actually makes sure that happens correctly and the people who get it deserve it. So Olodumari accepted completely because these were wonderful terms. It took quite a load off of his back and Eshu was still important and still going to be involved. And um, then the Big Bang happened, which actually happened in the Odu of Eyobe, which is the expansion of the universe, light, all of these different things. So Eshu was present far before human beings, far before the world, far before anything. And he was there right at the dawn of uh, creation because it actually came from him, him being the darkness and Olodumari being the light and them learning how to coexist, right? So that's the first thing. He was not born, he is the darkness. We talked about some of the things that were there in the beginning and his interaction with Olodumari or God Supreme. 
But even God didn't want problems with Eshu, right? He wanted to coexist with him because he knew how, uh, how treacherous he could be. So he said, you know, I want to interact with this guy. He's going to be my other half. Where the Yoruba faith is uh, pretty commonly uh, stating that Eshu is not Satan. And he really isn't. He's nothing more than the balance, right? Olodumari is the light, the progress, Ejobe. And then Oyekumeji is Eshu, or the darkness, or the absence of light. And all of its manifestations till modern day, right? So now that we've gone over the concept of Eshu, let's go over the concept of Elegwa or Elegba. And when we translate that name in Yoruba, it's a compound word like most things in Yoruba are. And the first uh, part of that word is Ele, which means to carry or to, uh, to have, right? Or to receive. And then we have the other aspect, which is Egba or Ba, which means to take or receive. So ele means carry and ba means receive. So when we put both of those together and we have elegba, it, me it means he who carries that which is received. And that really makes a point towards elegua's role within the pantheon where he receives the offerings or the ebos because we cannot perform ebo without eshu receiving it first and foremost or it being taken to the ojubo eshu or the altar of eshu so that eshu can perform his role and one of the various odus that speaks of it of him taking our offerings to heaven that's why eshu eats every time an animal is sacrificed that's why he's involved in all the ebos he's the last stop before heaven so he takes that which is received from humans to the gods, right? Of course, charging a, uh, a very small tax, you know, because he's always got to get broken off before he takes it up there. So, Elegua is the Orisha aspect of Eshu. So, why in the world would Eshu want to become an Orisha? Because as such, Eshu technically was not an Orisha at the beginning of time. Because to become an Orisha, you must be born with a selected destiny and then die, right? You have to become a deified ancestor, which is what an Orisha is. So why would Eshu, the owner of the universe, care about becoming Orisha when basically the expanse of the cosmos was his, right? And it actually came from bullying, right? And what ended up happening was, is the other Orishas would look at Eshu and they would ridicule him and taunt him and say, you know, Mr. Big Owner of the Universe, that's all good, but no one offers to you or no one performs sacrifice to you. And he kind of looked at them and he said, you know, I really have nothing to rebuttal because it's true. I, I own the world. I own the universe. I own everything within it. All the absence of light and all the corners and spaces. But really, no one makes offerings to me. And he kind of looked at them and he said, you guys watch. Not only am I going to become an Orisha and receive offerings, I'm going to receive them every time you guys receive them and before you. And of course, they laughed and taunted and all of these different things. And that's when Eshu, unbeknownst to anybody, actually manifested inside of a human body that was born to the name of Elegba, right? So what ended up happening is Eshu actually occupied a human body by way of birth. He basically, uh, you know, interjected, took a destiny and took it upon himself to be born without really asking permission from anybody. And what ended up happening was, is he actually got born into a royal family and that royal family you're going to see a couple different names um one of his mother one of the various names his mother is given is Anagui and uh you're going to see his father's name possibly being Ekuboro or Okuboro or this actually eradicates sometimes and I found scripture within the Odu of Irete Kutang that speaks of the birth of Eshu as an Orisha right so what ended up happening was is the famous story of the coconut where Eshu um basically was a prince he was living life. Um, he was enjoying all the all the benefits of being a prince and being part of the royal family and doing of his and what he wanted to do. And um, he really didn't take much instruction. He didn't take much guidance from his parents, being that we're talking about the owner of the universe in, a, in an adolescent body. So, you know, his father, the king, was constantly trying to say, hey, you know, occupy more kingly duties, do different things, you know, start occupying this role. You know, this kingdom is going to be yours one day. And Elegua persisted in not doing so, and he would go out hunting and things like that. Um, there's various versions of the story, but what ended up happening in one of them was that he found a coconut that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting to him. And he's like, you know, I'm gonna take this home because it was, uh, you know, it was a, a fruit and whatnot. And in some versions, it was glowing when he got it in the forest. In others, it was glowing when he put it behind his door. But either way, 
Unfortunately, the next day he passed away. Some people say when he picked up the coconut, he got shot with an arrow by one of his friends, or when he saw the coconut basically glowing, he passed away in his sleep, right? So after this happened, it was a huge tragedy. And of course, everyone was very sad, but something even worse happened after that, which was an epidemic. And it started, you know, killing people, famine happened, all of these different things. And the king called upon the Babalawos to be able to divine why all this was happening since the prince's transition. And they were able to deduce that what was causing all of this was an object behind the prince's door. And when they went there, they found the coconut and it was all rotten and full of, uh, full of worms and things like that. It was basically suffering from the same thing or the people were suffering from the same conditions that the coconut was suffering from. So they came up with an idea or basically a divination method and, and they were told to perform sacrifice with rocks. And basically they switched the rock for the coconut because rocks are immortal. And because of this, it was seen as a method to prevent being that this object in this corner was gonna dictate how the land was gonna do. They said, let's put an object there that's not gonna suffer from famine or epidemic to be able to make sure that this never happens to us again. And thus, the rock of El Egua was born, which you'll see on the top of basically every Afro-Cuban or even traditional issue. You're always going to see a Yangi stone or you're going to see a type of rock where it's present there. And that represents the Orisha aspect of issue because he was born and died with, through which being of El Egua, right? The Orisha aspect of issue being El Egua. And this is where the phrase Ikulo Biosha comes from. A lot of people will translate it and say, Egum must be propitiated before Osha or Orisha when there's another translation that says we must go through the process of Iku or death to become Osha or Orisha or deified ancestors. And just like that, Elegua became an Orisha. And ironically, even though the other Orishas were present in the land of the king and, and queen where he was a son of and became born, you know, none of the other Orishas could resolve this issue. But when people realized that by attending to Elegua, this deified ancestor, everything went well, they said, well, you know, from this day forward, we're going to attend to him first. And if he doesn't work it out, then we'll start focusing on the other ones. So when he goes back to heaven and he remanifests his issue and everybody heard what happened, they all kind of looked at him and he said, man, what do you guys have to say now? I told you, not only would I become an Orisha, but I'll be attended to before you. Right, and this is Eshu at his uh his finest and most prime form as the trickster god. There's nothing this man doesn't get. In my opinion, most important energy in the universe, right up there with Ori. Because if you don't take care of Eshu, things get worse. I always tell my initiates, when you receive Eshu, if you can do nothing else, take care of him, and things won't get worse. And in the Odu of Eobe, he says it. My friends are those who feed me. My enemies are those who can see me starve without. Um, taking care of taking care of me or attending to me, right? There's another version where Eshu became the first of the Orishas um, by basically saving Olodumari's life when he got sick. There's another version in Obeyonu where uh, Eshu actually fought Isha Orisha and was able to gain that post as king of Orisha or the first of the Orishas. Various, various, various stories, but at the end of the day, Eshu became number one in the form of Elegua, right? So we were able to touch on each of them individually. So when did these things or these gentlemen or these energies become one formally? And we can find this in the Odu of Iroso Ojekung or Iroso Matelekung. And what ended up happening was is each of the Orishas went to have their icon confection. They went to Olodumare to see how they were going to be manifested in a physical, natural form, right? And, you know, for all those who are initiated, we know what each of the Orishas are composed of. But Eshu is an interesting dichotomy because he's kind of got a bunch of things going on. So when Eshu went to Olodumare, Olodumare knew this was going to be a difficult task because Eshu is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But the issue was is... Olodumari cannot confection someone necessarily with 121 different rocks, which is all the positions that Eshu occupies within nature, at least 121. He's everywhere. The garbage, the four corners, three corners, the, the, the forest, the ocean, he's everywhere. So Olodumari said, how do we make this as productive as possible? And um, without divulging too much, Eshu came up with the idea, along with Olodumari, that 
you know, rather than having 121 rocks, being that I only manifested one time through the form of El Egua, I'll have one rock, but within me, I will have everything that is necessary for me to be able to be everywhere at once, the way it has always been. And that way people can attend to me and all of me all at once through their personal issues. So Olodumare saw the ingenuity and he said, you know, I'm with that. And they basically put a seal on it until this day, we have that form of Eshu. And even in Nigeria, the Eshus, you're gonna notice they have the two aspects, right? Eshu is whatever is in the cement head or plate or receptacle. And Elegua or the Orisha aspect is the rock that goes on top, whether it be a Yangi, whether it be any of the rocks that you can get from any position in nature, this is where they became one. Until this day, if you notice, the sons of Elegua, when they crown or they become initiated, their name is always Eshu something. Eshu Niwe, Eshu Lona, Eshu, etc. Because they're actually sons of Eshu. That is their root. That is their... I don't want to say Irumole because Eshu is not the light, but that is their, their spiritual root, is Eshu. And even though the title of Elegba was given to him in this life, does not take away from who he really was and who everyone understood him to be, which is Eshu. So the sons of Elegua are technically sons of Eshu. The only reason we say Elegua is a form of respect and remembrance to when Eshu became Orisha and was able to manifest through there. But at the end of the day, these guys are synonymous. They are the same thing. It's nothing more than verbiage at that point. And this is where they became one, where Eshu, I mean, a great way to basically uh, make an analogy for it is the yin and yang, right? You have the black aspect or the dark aspect, with his, which is Eshu, and you have the light or Orisha aspect, which is Elegua. And if you notice, they're constantly in balance. They're constantly moving and shape-shifting and all these different things, but they always maintain that balance. And that's what the form of Eshu really represents. Or even if you look at my shirt, this circular form could even be um, reminiscent of Eshu Laboni, right? The Eshu with the flat face that goes in the plate, but issue is what's in the plate and then the rock goes on top. My personal opinion, every issue should have a rock just uh, based on Odu and whatnot. But you are going to see some issues that don't. And that's perfectly fine because in scripture, especially in the Afro-Cuban aspect, you're going to find some issues that don't. Or even Eshu Alaje, which is a very traditional issue, does not have a rock. But he's a completely different concept. But the issues that we're receiving up front when we first receive issue, they should. And, you know, all the other ones are kind of auxiliary at that point. So guys, I really hope I was able to clarify some things from you. I know I'm going to get some great questions in the comments. If you love this shirt, we're selling them here at Botanica Candles and more. Meet me at the crossroads so you won't be lonely, right? Eshu shirts. And we're coming out with Odisha shirts for every video for all different Odishas. If you're interested, please contact 407-440-2086, Botanica Candles and more. We're open every day except holidays. And on Sundays, 11 to 4, every other day from 11 to 7. Also want to make another mention. So appreciative and so humbled. We are over a 1,000 subscribers and climbing steadily. I haven't had a chance to really mention it. I just got done with the Hand of Ifa. Initiated five more people into my religious house. So blessed with so many God children. We're doing the right thing over here in Orumila and Olodumari. And especially Eshu blesses us all the time here at uh, Botanica Candles and more in Joseph Baba Ifa. So more videos on Eshu coming up as far as different aspects of him. We're going to be breaking it up just to make it more easier for you to find those topics that you need a refresher on and uh, making it that much easier for you. Just more information coming at you all the time. Be sure to put more videos, ideas in the comments. And guys, we really appreciate you over here. Everything's going wonderfully. You know, things are really revving up towards the end of the year for consultations, any of these things. Even if you're planning on getting red next year, you definitely want to schedule now because things are getting quite hectic as we're progressing through November. So guys, we, we really appreciate you. Joseph Babai Fa, as well as Botanica Candles and more. Today's Monday. Make sure you take care of Elegua. Very important. And until next time, may Olodumari bless us all. Borui boye bochiche. Take care, family.